Good morning, everyone. I'm Eileen Gilmer. I'm the associate pastor here at Trinity Church, and we all welcome you. We are so glad you're here in worship with us this last Sunday in June. Can you believe it? Pastor Neil Huff, our senior pastor, will be along with a great message for us, and we have some beautiful music to share. So we are glad you're here with us. There's a place for you to register your attendance. You can click on another link to get the bulletin. And we hope that you will grab your Bible so you can read along with us. Welcome to Worship at Trinity. Trinity Ensemble. Please join me now for our call to worship. Lord of healing and mercy, remind us again of your power to heal our lives from fears and mistrust. Open our hearts to believe in your restorative power and your great compassion for us. Give us healing and make us agents of peace for you in this, your world. Amen. Our hymn can be found in your e-bulletin, Sing with all the saints in glory. We will sing verses 1 and 2. Will you join us?
follow along for our scripture readings today in your Bible. If not, you can also find them printed in the bulletin. Our first is from Philippians 3. Hear now the word of God. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Our second scripture reading comes from the book of Hebrews. It is from the 12th chapter. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that has been set before us. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart." Good morning and welcome once again to worship here at Trinity Church. My name is Neil Hoff. I am so glad that you have joined us for worship today. I'm pleased to be joined in worship leadership uh, by my colleague Eileen Gilmer, as well as our musicians, wonderful musicians, led by Jerry Rich and Catherine Wethington. We are so thankful that they can help us worship together, and I'm thankful that you have joined us. Uh, As we are considering today, we're continuing to consider our spiritual fitness and uh, what it means to run the race uh, that God has set before us in Christ. And so as we consider what that means for us today, I want to invite you to join me now in a moment of prayer. Eternal God, we are grateful for your presence. We trust that you will uh, direct and guide the words that I speak aloud, that you will be present as we reflect and meditate on your word and consider its meaning for our lives. And we pray that you will bless all that we do today and uh, that we draw closer to you and closer to one another as we serve you as faithful disciples of Jesus. Bless us today, we pray in the name of the living Christ. Amen. So this is uh, the second of two uh, sermons in a short series that uh, I'm preaching. I'm calling the series Fitness 101. And uh, as we are in the summer season now, and we are, many of us, getting ready to hit the beach or the pool or the golf course or the tennis course or the hiking trail, uh, we want to be in shape physically. Maybe we wish we'd started a little bit earlier, but we, we want to be in good physical shape. And what I've discovered uh, is that there are parallels between physical fitness and spiritual fitness. And I think the Bible, I'm, I'm convinced that the Bible uh, makes those same comparisons. And so uh, last week we talked about practice making perfect and, and uh, some of the lessons we learn uh, from our desires to get in physical shape, how they apply to our spiritual fitness today. We're going to talk about uh, running the race and using that image that uh, we find in more than one place in the New Testament, uh, running a race and how that uh, helps us understand our Christian life together. So uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is just, there's just two sermons in this short series because next week, the four, July 4th, uh, we're going to start a brand new series about the parables of Jesus and we're going to start that in person in the sanctuary. And so look for announcements. You're going to get a lot from us this week about this. But Sunday, the July 4th at 8.30 and 10.30 here in the sanctuary, both services in the sanctuary, we're going to worship in person. And uh, we look forward to uh, Pastor Eileen and I leading in worship and uh, preach, reading and preaching about the parables. And uh, it's going to be a great summer together. And just want to remind you that we're going to continue to offer online worship. We know that, A, people travel. And B, not everybody's ready to come back. So uh, you can still find us uh, online, uh, on YouTube, and on Facebook uh, throughout the summer and moving forward. So we are uh, looking forward to worshiping with you together in person if you're able, uh, but also online. 
Uh, and so we're thinking about this, this physical fitness image that helps us understand our spiritual fitness. And so uh, if we want to be physically healthy, uh, I think that helps us understand what it means to be spiritually healthy. So again, you know, uh, I hope that the uh, Olympic Games will be happening this summer in Tokyo. And uh, many of us will be watching some of the events. Uh, we see some of the best athletes in the world who have spent their lifetimes training uh, for these events. And, uh, and maybe that will inspire us in our own lives. Maybe we're not going to run a, a, an Olympic race, but maybe we can seek to be uh, at the best, possible, the best possible people God wants us to be as followers of Jesus. And so the Greek world of the New Testament uh, was the home of the ancient Olympic Games, and uh, in fact, Corinth, uh, which is the site of one of the churches that Paul uh, founded and he wrote to multiple times, was the home of the Isthmian Games. And so the world of athletes and competitions was familiar to them and, and popular. Uh, and so in the early church and kind of throughout the history of, of God's world and uh, God's people, uh, uh, we've seen parallels between kind of this physical fitness and physical training and physical uh, athletic events and the spiritual life. And so it includes goals and desires and striving. You need all of that in both endeavors uh, and training. And so what we said last week was the principles for training physically uh, apply to our lives spiritually, our relationship with God. Uh, that we need training partners and we take a holistic approach. We take care of our whole selves and we start where we are. Those are some of the lessons we learned last week. And so like the, like the modern Olympic Games, the ancient games included track events, running races. And, uh, and so running the race of Christian life became a very clear metaphor uh, for early Christians uh, as they saw themselves as running a race and, and, and seeing the finish line out in front of them and, and striving and straining to get there. Uh, and so if we think of our lives as, as a race, uh, as an event for which we are training with a goal for w- that we are seeking, uh, it helps us, uh, I think, I, for me at least, take the next steps, literally, um, in Uh, our life with Jesus. So Paul, uh, writing to the Corinthians, says, again, they understand this image. says, do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. You know, friends, we know that the the ultimate gift that we receive from God is a gift of grace. So we go to heaven because God is good, not because necessarily we're good. Uh, we're saved by grace through faith. That's, that's the promise that, uh, that we claim. Uh, but Paul says we still run the race as if we want to win it because there's something for us in that race. Because we want to be the people God desires that we be. Uh, uh, we, with, we compete with the same intensity to be uh, faithful followers of Jesus, the same intensity that, athletic, that Olympic athletes uh, compete with in their attempt to win gold medals. And that's the image that Paul is inviting us to consider. So we're going to consider it today. And what I want to say is that in this race, in the running the life of uh, a follower of Jesus, that it's a marathon and not a sprint. We might like the idea of it being a sprint and we just run 100 meters and we can rest when we get there, but I think the, the Christian journey, the life of discipleship is a marathon, not a sprint. We may note that there is urgency in the New Testament. That's important. Uh, the New Testament writers uh, expected Jesus to return in their lifetime. They expected it to be eminent and they, there was a sense of urgency in their mission and ministry to be prepared and be ready and share the good news as quickly and as widely as possible. They were thinking short term. And we find examples of that throughout the New Testament. Uh, and I want to say that urgency is not a bad thing. But 2,000 years have passed, and we, and we recognize that, that God's timing is not the same as our timing. And we still want to have that urgency, and we still want to share the good news and be ready for uh, when our day comes and when Christ returns and the promise of, of hitting that finish line. We want to be ready for that. And so uh, we hear that urgency, and we take it on. It's a need for forgiveness and repentance and faith and, and discipleship and all that uh, we, we find in, in the New Testament uh, message to us. But the passing of time, even in the first century, led, uh, has led us to, to think again about what God is at, what God is all, 
what God is doing, what God is about in this. In fact, uh, 2 Peter, one of the later books uh, written in the New Testament, says, while you are waiting, while you're waiting for Jesus to return, regard the patience of our Lord, his, his patience, as our salvation. In other words, um, this is an opportunity for us to continue to share the good news, continue to serve Christ, to make the world, uh, help the world understand who God is and what God desires for us, that we live the life, the kingdom life that God intends. But because our Lord is patient, that the race of Christian life is a marathon, not a sprint. So the question is, uh, thinking of our Christian life as a marathon, what does that teach us? Now, let me offer a disclaimer. I've never run a marathon, trained for one. I did run a 10K a number of years ago with some friends, and uh, it was a meaningful experience, and I, I kind of been drawing on that a little bit as I think about this, uh, this sermon, but I'm not a long-distance runner. Uh, not that um, I wouldn't benefit from training as a long-distance runner to get in better physical fitness, in better physical shape, uh, but I, using this image to help me think about my spiritual journey the marathon of my spiritual journey as well. And so last week I offered some lessons that are applicable to uh, training for this race. I said we need to be part of a group with the same goals. When you run together, it's so much easier. You can encourage and support one another. That training partner uh, can be just a a wonderful accountability partner in in life that applies in many areas of our life. Uh, To have a holistic plan, we need to have a good diet. And if we're going to train Uh, We need to encompass our entire lives. Uh, We start where we are. I couldn't run a marathon today. I could start training today, but I couldn't run a marathon today. So I start where I am. Um, And then you actually have to run. You can't just think about it or imagine it or read about it. We have to actually hit the road or hit the treadmill and actually do it. So so those are some of the lessons that I talked about last week. I want to offer some more lessons today or ideas for us to think about as we think about the marathon of our Christian life. And the first thing I want to say is we need to know where we're going. Runners, when they're competing in a race, know where the finish line is. They know where they're headed. They begin with the end in mind. For Paul, the writer of the letter of the Philippians, uh, he says that the goal, the finish line is the resurrection of the dead, eternal life. It's the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus, or some of the words he used. But here's what we know is that Christian life is not just professing our faith and then waiting passively. You know, a couple couple weeks ago, we confirmed 14 of our young people. And what we want to say to them, and what I tried to say to them, and what I want to continue to encourage them is the confirmation wasn't the end, and now, okay, they profess their faith, and they can sit quietly and, and do nothing and just wait. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of a life with Christ. And so... One part of the goal is not just to get to heaven. We want that, and God promises that, and it's a gift of grace for us. But God also, in Christ, sets for us a goal of sanctification. Again, that's a churchy word, but it means being like Jesus. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, says, be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So we want to, to allow God to work in us as we run the race, to be the people God desires that we be, to live the life God intends, to be perfected in love. So when we begin with that goal in mind of what God desires for us in the world today and in the world to come, then we can run the race effectively. So begin with the end in mind. Life eternal with God and perfection and love along the way. So that's the first thing. Know where we're going. The second thing is to learn to love the journey. Uh, Training for a marathon requires hours and hours and miles and miles of training. Now, it helps if you actually enjoy the process of training. If it's misery for you, you're not going to keep going. But if you're training with a friend, you're training with somebody you like or somebody you love, and and you're on this journey together, and if you experience joy along the way, it's so much easier. It's so much easier. So Christian discipleship is so much more than just waiting to go to heaven. And so we need to learn to love the life that God has given us. And you see, one of the things, I, one of the reasons I think we as a Christian struggle to witness to the world is, is the world thinks we're miserable. They don't see much joy in us. We're just angry and hating all the time. And that's not Jesus, I don't think. And and that's not the life I want to live. But but that's the image that we often portray because we we haven't yet learned to enjoy the journey, enjoy the 
the training. And so if we learn to enjoy our time with God in prayer every day, and that's the most important time of our day, we learn to enjoy coming together and worshiping, which we're going to do next week, and not just sitting here so Pastor Eileen and I can entertain you and the musicians can can uh, help you have a good experience as a consumer of religious services, but to come and actually worship, to sing and to pray and to reflect and to read scripture with us and just to uh, allow yourself to be soaked up in the praise and worship of God, to, to let that be the most important time of your week. Uh, love that time together. Love reading the Bible, even the difficult parts, as we, as we uh, learn to understand what God desires for us and, and learn to love serving and to find those opportunities to make a difference in the world. Um, sometimes we just have to do it. You know, we're not feeling very joyful. We just have to do it. And uh, the joy comes along the way. But if we learn to love the journey, I think uh, the journey is more meaningful and we're far more likely to keep going, right? In the world of sports, we talk about uh, we, want the, we, want, we want our teams and our favorite athletes to have the will to win, right? But I think about that in comparison to what I, I read that Joe Gibbs, who was the most successful coach in the recent history of the Washington football team, would say that he didn't want players that had the will to win. He wanted players that had the will to prepare. In other words, he wanted to put the work in Monday through Saturday so they'd be ready on Sunday when the games, uh, when the whistle blew and the game started. Uh, to love that time together, have the will to prepare. George Leonard is a, a, was a writer, uh, Army Air Corps, a pilot, martial artist, and describes uh, kind of the process of, for any uh, discipline, uh, the process of mastery. And he compares it with those that kind of, he calls them dabblers, you know, do one thing to the next, or obsessives that just dive in 100% and then burn out uh, after a short period of time, or, or hackers that just, uh, kind of play along at, uh, at various things. He says uh, that we are most fulfilled on the path of mastery, where we learn to love the journey, learn to love what he calls the plateau, and we don't seem to be making progress as we keep training, but we trust that eventually we're going to take that next step forward, right? And so he says, find joy in practice, find joy in your training, find joy in your life. And so we, as followers of Jesus, want to find joy in our life with God. We want to find joy as followers of Jesus. We want to find joy in the spiritual disciplines. I think that is, uh, that is a gift that God offers us, the invitation that we have. And so love the practices of faith. Love your time with God. Love your worship. Love your service. Love giving. Uh, that, that, friends, that's possible to experience joy and generosity. And keep the end in mind, uh, that journey that we're taking living life to the fullest that God desires that we live, knowing that we are secure in God's grace. So loving the journey is the easy sign. That's the second thing. Be, the, having the goal or the end in mind, loving the journey, and then make sure you get some rest along the way. I think that's essential, right? But I think it's really hard for 21st century North American, Northern Virginians. We work so many hours, and we probably think we should work more. And then in the time we have left over, we try to cram in everything else, family and friends and, and church and, and hobbies and, and everything else. Uh, and then we put like getting enough rest as the final thing on our list. And then we wonder why we're exhausted all the time and we have no energy or find no joy. And so training for a marathon requires a, a delicate balance of rest and training and, 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 uh, and effort. Uh, and the same is true in Christian discipleship. Jesus is our ultimate example. We find in the Gospels this pattern of advance and retreat, of being active and intense and intense in ministry and then stepping away. As you're reading the Gospels, how, notice how many times we're told that Jesus goes off by himself to pray or is alone, sends, them, sends the disciples ahead and stays behind to pray or spends the whole night in prayer, um, kind of advance and retreat. For us, we might think of it simply as keeping Sabbath. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It's uh, practiced by Jesus, but it's hard for us in the 21st century world, the 24-7 world in which we live. Uh, so it's, but keeping the Sabbath is not just a commandment. It's a gift to us. It's written into us that we, we thrive when we have enough rest and we take time away from the busyness, the work of the world, including the work of church. Just, we just to take time to be with God, to be renewed to allow God to recreate us. That's what God is always doing. So keeping the Sabbath in uh, the Hebrew world was uh, what we would call Saturday, sunset Friday to sunset Saturday. 
As Christians, we worship the resurrected Jesus who was raised from the dead on the first day of the week. So that's become our day for many of us. Uh, But the point is to make it part of our, our weekly cycle. To find moments and days and times in our lives that we can step away from the busyness of life and, and, and rest, renew, spend time with God, allow God to recreate us. And so um, we have so much to do and we find it really hard. But if we're going to live the life, if we're going to train for the life that God desires for us, rest, uh, Sabbath keeping has to be part of it. Um, I think... Uh, there are so many different, we, maybe another time, another place, we'll talk more intently about Sabbath keeping, but just, just know that that's an essential part of running this marathon of Christian life and keeping the Sabbath and, and resting and renewing and being renewed and recreated by God is, is so essential. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing would be to lighten the load. It's hard to run the race when you're carrying a burden, Right? Uh, again, sometimes there are, we do carry burdens. We carry burdens for one another. Uh, we carry burdens with us, some burdens that we have a hard time setting down. Uh, sometimes we intentionally take up a burden. Uh, I read recently that uh, Dick Hoyt died. He was 80 years old. He was part of what was called Team Hoyt. Dick and his son, Rick, uh, ran marathons and, and triathlons together, more than 1,000 of them. But here's the catch. Dick did the running. Uh, Rick, who has cerebral palsy, uh, was either pushed or carried or pulled along the way. It's something that father and son can do together. And so Dick intentionally carried the burden of his son to do these athletic events and uh, a joy for both of them. Uh, there's another example, uh, Noah Aldrich, uh, who a uh, young, healthy uh, young boy, 10, 11 years old, uh, did the same for his younger brother, Lucas. Maybe not to the extent of the grown-up Dick Hoyt, but carried that burden so they could enjoy, run the race together. So sometimes we do that. But here's what we read in Hebrews, and we know this to be true. To run the race, we need to set down our burdens. Here's what uh, Hebrews 12.1 says. It says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight. Let us follow their example. Lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Sometimes we have physical burdens that we can't set down. Sometimes we take up burdens intentionally. But many of us are burdened by spiritual burdens or emotional burdens. We carry the burden of sin and guilt and shame or anger and hatred or lust or envy or greed. We carry the burden of hubris. Uh, We may carry the burden of regret or disappointment about the past or worry or anxiety about the future or fear or doubt about our lives. Uh, those burdens can weigh us down in keeping from running the race. So what we know is that God promises to lift those burdens. We can lay them aside because God loves us and cares for us and forgives us. That's the gift of God's grace, and it's so freeing when we experience it. We feel lighter so that we can run the race before us. That's the promise of abundant life, I think. Running the race requires that we travel lightly. Anne and I like to travel, and uh, when we can, we go to England to spend time with her family and uh, our friends there. And uh, we often have disagreements about how much stuff to take. Uh, uh, Anne wants to make sure we have everything we need. I think maybe we should try to travel pack lightly. Well, I'll be honest, we usually take all the stuff that Anne thinks we need to take. Uh, and she's right, because she's experienced at this. And, uh, uh, but, you know, that's a lot of stuff that we have to carry around. Uh, and I know that in the life of faith, though, there's some things that we want to let go of. You know, we moved last year. And when you move, you discover how much stuff you have. And some folks, some of you may have downsized or be thinking about downsizing. And you do that, you'll realize how much stuff you have. And the truth is, most of us have more stuff than we need. They've become burdens for us. And maybe we need to practice a spiritual discipline of simplicity. Let's be clear about what we need and what we have and what's most important to us. I think that's how we lighten the load. That's how we lay aside the burdens, to be clear about what's most important so that we can run the race and keep our eyes on the prize and, and strain forward to, to get where God wants us to be. So you might want to add the practice of inner and outer simplicity to your uh, spiritual disciplines as we Focus our lives on what's most important to us and lay aside everything else. You see, that's what it is to run the the marathon of Christian life. That is to to lay aside 
what's unessential so that we can focus on what's most essential. It's challenging, friends. I know it's hard. Um, But it's so rewarding because we want to get there. We want to be the people God desires that we be. We want to to be clear that we are God's people in this world and and live eternally with God uh, forever. And so the final thing I want to say about this marathon of Christian life is don't give up. What I've, what I've known in my own uh, meager attempts to train for something and, and what I've heard from those that have trained for and run marathons is that there's a wall that you hit where you just feel like you can't go any, any further. And that's where you need the people that have trained with you and are running with you to, to encourage you, maybe to hold you, maybe to push you or pull you along the way because we know that if we can just keep taking one step after the another, we'll, we'll get past the wall, we'll get through the wall. And, and we will end up uh, at the finish line. So don't give up. We need patience, endurance, and perseverance. And all those are gifts from God. God will help us along the way. And we need to remember Jesus. Uh, this is really what Hebrews 12 is saying, to remember Jesus. Hear it again. It says, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. In other words, Jesus makes it possible for us to live this life. So when we feel like we want to give up, remember Jesus. Remember his example, his teaching, his endurance, and, and his gift. So be clear about where we're going and and where the finish line is and um, learn to love the journey, to love what uh, these experiences that we live life together today as followers of Jesus. Uh, Lighten the load. Um, Don't uh, don't remember that you take it with you uh, all the way. Um, Just keep, keep going and get some rest along the way. All of these are, are essential for our life as followers of Jesus. So... We come to the end of this short series. We think about life as uh, in comparison, uh, spiritual life in comparison to our physical lives and our physical health and our spiritual health and our physical fitness and our spiritual fitness. I hope you've been able to make some of those connections. But the question I want to leave you with is, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? As you get in shape to run the marathon of Christian life, what's next? What are you going to do this week? Be ready to run this race. Whatever you do, whatever you do, friends, just keep running. Because it's a marathon, not a sprint. Let us pray. Eternal God, we are grateful that you have called us to run this race. And it's long and hard, and sometimes we want to give up. But we know that when we are intentional about training to run this race, when we train our spiritual beings the way we can train our physical beings, we can run the race with joy and endurance and perseverance because you run with us. So I ask you to give us the courage we need to be your people, to run this marathon, to know where we're headed and what you desire and dream for us to to enjoy the journey every moment along the way with you and with one another, to, to get the rest we need, to, uh, to be strong and capable and faithful, to lighten the load, to set aside the burdens, to allow you to forgive our sin and, and, and lift the burdens that we carry. And, and just we, we ask you to, to give us the courage we need to keep going, just to keep going. We know that we do carry burdens and we bring them now and some of them are needs for physical healing or spiritual comfort or uh, the life that you've called us to live. And and so we, we just... We just rest before you right now as we, as we keep the Sabbath today in this moment and allow you to, to speak to us and speak through us, to heal us and comfort us and strengthen us and guide us. And as you, you call us into action to be instruments of your healing in a world that needs to hear good news, so we pray that, that you will call your church into action to, to serve in this community and in this nation and this world that desperately needs what only you can provide. We ask you to give us the courage and strength we need to keep going, to keep taking one step after another as we follow Jesus. We thank you that we can run this race with you, that, that no matter our physical abilities, we can be your people. 
that you, that you do call us to this life and you invite us to the eternal life you promised and the life of, of perfection and love uh, that is possible through your grace. So I ask that you hear these prayers and all the prayers that your people are praying at this hour. We pray them with confidence. We pray them with faith because we pray them in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we continue our worship and respond to this message of good news about the possibility of running the race with God, that, uh, uh, getting to that finish line, persevering and enduring, experiencing the joy uh, of this life together with God, I want to remind you that uh, one of the spiritual disciplines that we can learn to love is the the discipline of generosity. And that uh, I think our lives are changed and we uh, are willing to give back to God a part of what God has given us. And uh, and we believe that uh, we are blessed when we do that. We also know that God blesses and multiplies our gifts and makes a difference in the world. And so... um, Uh, I'm hoping that in the coming weeks, as we uh, are able to do more and more of our ministry in person, that we'll see what God is doing, and uh, and that we'll be able to celebrate that and recognize that uh, it's possible when we respond to God's invitations. And so keep running that race, friends, Uh, and a part of that race is is, uh, giving back to God a part of what God has given us, and so find joy in that. That's my prayer for you today. So let us uh, receive our offerings as we uh, return to God, a part of what God has given us. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, let us give it this one, at this time. Good morning again, everyone. We are glad you're in worship with us, and what a beautiful service it is today. I invite you to look in the bulletin for information on things that are upcoming, including Pastor Neal's Bible study. He is uh, doing the Psalms, and if you have not jumped in and been at one earlier, not to worry. You can always start this week. You know he'd love to have you. It is on uh, Tuesday mornings and Wednesday evenings, and you can find the time and how to join via Zoom in our bulletin. You can also join us and find information in the bulletin about our prayer group. We meet on Wednesday mornings via Zoom. And you'll notice in the bulletin there is a lengthy prayer list. These are names of our uh, fellow parishioners, friends, loved ones, just those in general in our community for which we are in prayer. And I invite you to make that part of your prayer life and keep all of those families and those individuals in prayer. Our big news is we are going to be back in worship in the sanctuary next Sunday. That is July 4th. If you're in town, please join us. We will be here worshiping inside. Now, if you are out of town or not quite ready to join, we will still have this recorded uh, service on Zoom and on Facebook, so you can join us that way as well. Either way, we look forward to being in worship with you here at Trinity Church. Our hymn can be found in your e-bulletin. When we all get to heaven, we will sing verses 1 and 4. Will you join us? Thank you. 
Friends, thank you so much for joining us for worship today. Uh, once again, uh, as we've said over and we're going to say it over and over again, we look forward to being in the sanctuary next Sunday on the 4th of July as we worship together. And uh, we hope that's a, we know it's a holiday weekend, but I hope if you're in town, you'll join us. If not in person, join us for worship uh, online uh, as we consider the parables of Jesus and what they mean for us. We're excited about uh, that opportunity and hope that you will continue to train for and run the race that God sets before you. Uh, knowing that by God's grace, we will get where, we, where God intends, and that's good news. So here are the words of benediction. You'll find them printed in the bulletin today. Beloved of God, healed and forgiven, blessed and strengthened, go forth to be a blessing to others, proclaiming the love and mercy of God in all that you do and say. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in God's grace and peace. Amen.